Hello and welcome to I Know Dino. I'm Garrett. And I'm Sabrina. And today in our 298th episode, we have a bunch of news, including a new Alvarasaurid from Hell Creek. Ooh. Everybody's, or almost everybody's, favorite formation. Well, it's no Morrison, but it's still pretty cool. <laughs> Everyone that isn't a huge sauropod fan, like all the T-Rex and Triceratops lovers, like the Hell Creek the best. We also have Dinosaur of the Day, Scolosaurus, a nice Ankylosaurid. Did you pick that because it's my birthday and you wanted to? I guess that worked out that way, but we also got a request. Okay. I see how it is. <laughs> but before we get into that, we want to thank some of our patrons. And this week, we'd like to thank Risa, Lucas and Eli, Wurgersaurus, Ewan, Brendan Cavanaugh, Albertasaurus, Taya, Dino Bo, Kelly, and Richard. Thanks so much, everybody. We really appreciate all of your support. Keep those dinosaur requests coming. And you can join our community at patreon.com slash inodino. So jumping into the news, we're going to kick it off with our new Alvarez Sorid, which is pretty cool. You may have seen it in the headlines as the Captain Hook dinosaur. <laughs> uh, there were some funny comments on our Discord server where people are like, well, you can't say that it's like a T-Rex, even though it's in the Hell Creek formation. So how else can you associate it with pop culture? Captain Hook. That's the obvious way. <laughs> but actually... It might have been named after Captain Hook. So, <laughs> all right. It, like I said, it was from the Hell Creek Formation, and the article was written by Denver Fowler and others and published in Cretaceous Research. And the Alvarosaurid, maybe first I should say what Alvarosaurids are, because they're not the most well known group, but they're really interesting. They're super weird. They're generally very small, like velociraptor real velociraptor type size like smaller than a dog basically with very short arms like extremely short arms even shorter than something like t-rex with just a single claw at the end of each arm although that claw is very large so they're really weird it's like why would you have such a large claw but such small arms you'd think if your arms were shrinking you wouldn't be using them why have the huge claw so they're kind of a mysterious group the main hypothesis is that their claws were used to break open termite mounds or maybe rotting wood to get at insects, and therefore having them close to the body just means that there's less leverage to deal with, and there are other animals that don't have incredibly long arms that also do this today. And this dinosaur is no exception. It also has big claws and presumably short arms, although we didn't find much of the arms. It's named Triarch Uncus prairiensis. Triarchuncus is not my favorite dinosaur name. It's really hard to read. <laughs> I'm not even sure if I'm saying it right. But it comes from Triarch, I assume, which is the Greek name for a trireme ship, and then Uncus, which is Latin for hook, if I'm saying it right. Reportedly, this references Captain Hook's ship because he drove, I guess, a trireme. Or what is it? Do you drive a ship? What do you do with a ship? Sail a ship? Sail. There we go. He sailed the trireme. Although I think triremes are rowed. So he commanded a trireme, hmm. something like that. And this is the Captain Hook from Peter Pan, I assume. It's not in the official description, so these are all just guesses. But we do know it's named after a trireme and a hook, officially. I wonder if it had a crocodile enemy. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> I think if you're that small, you have a lot of enemies. Mm, true. <laughs> then the species name, Prairiensis, is after the American Prairie Reserve, where it was found in northeastern Montana. It's a lot easier to say. Triarchuncus was found in the 1980s, but was only known as the Hell Creek Alvarosaur since then. And as far as I know, this is the first attempt at naming it and bringing together some different fossils. The holotype is its single characteristic claw, and only that single characteristic claw, which is 4.4 centimeters or 1.7 inches in outer arc length, so around the outer side of the claw. That's how long it is. Not that big, but it was a really small dinosaur, so relatively speaking, it was still a pretty big claw. In addition to the holotype, they also assigned some other fossils, not as the holotype, but just basically, we think these are also part of Triarchuncus. Originally, they were from the same area, really close. Some of them were a little bit deeper in the stratigraphy, so there's a little bit of a question about whether or not they're from the exact same animal, but they're all from pretty much the same quarry, although they're now scattered across the U.S. in different museums which probably made this kind of annoying to write the paper because they had to go all over the place <laughs> when they were starting in Montana. Among those different bones, there's a partial radius, 
which is, you know, part of the forearm. It's obviously very small since this dinosaur had really small arms. There's a foot bone, parts of the hips, and a couple of other claws. One of those claws is, quote, the most complete known for Alvarosauridae, end quote. So it's a very good claw. Oh, good. Yeah. <laughs> its claws are unusually curved, which you may have anticipated given its Captain Hook affinities. That's also its distinguishing characteristic, I imagine. So I thought that was going to be the case, but when I went through the holotype and the list of things that made it unique, they didn't mention the curvature of its claws. Oh. They mentioned in a lot of other little details like the you know, rugosity of something and the depth of a groove and mm -hmm. how much different parts stuck out from bones, but they didn't mention the curvature at all. Interesting. Yeah, I think really what they were going after is that our depiction of what Alvaro swords looked like has their claws basically not curved enough because, like I said, one of these claws is the most complete one and it's still not completely preserved. Hmm. So I guess when people were filling in the gaps before trying to guess at what the Alvarosaurid claw looked like, they reproduced it a little bit too straight. Mm -hmm. That's what they're arguing here. And in fact, they think that Mononychus or Mononychus would have had a more curved claw just like this one. Hmm. So maybe that's why it's not distinguishing is when they were looking into it, they were like, oh, wait a second. <laughs> Just alvarosaurids in general. Yeah, at least some of these more derived ones had pretty curved claws. Specifically, though, because I keep just saying curved, I want to try to explain how curved they are. They're not curved quite like a velociraptor claw. They're not like a super sickle shaped claw or like Captain Hook's claw <laughs> that basically makes almost a full 360 degree curve. This has 125 degrees of curvature or thereabouts, which is hard to depict. But basically, if you have your hand at rest, like if you just have it, you're not trying to straighten it out and you just kind of let it go to its neutral position, that's about the same amount of curvature. So it's sort of curved. A lot of animals have claws that are about that curved. It's nothing too extreme, but it's also more curved than some, just like a straight claw that you'd see on the earlier Alvarosaurids, for example. Probably the most important thing about it having these curved claws is that it helps to support a hook and pull action, as they call it, which means they could stab that claw into something and then pull back on it, and they could use that to open something up. Like rip open a termite nest kind of thing? Exactly. That's what they're saying. And that would be useful if they do, in fact, eat insects that they need to rip open logs or mount, termite mounds or something to get into. They also have what they think is a growth series of hand claws, but they refer to those other claws that they assigned as tentative and very tentative. So in other words, they're probably from Triarchuncus, but they might not be. <laughs> they could be from some other Alvarosaurid. But if they are a growth series, there are a couple things that we could learn from it. First of all is the claws got more robust as Triarchuncus aged, the bone also got a little bit more dense, and the grooves in the claw got deeper. Hmm. So that is useful because you need more blood supply potentially, or it could be for tendons or different things like that. And in case you're curious, of the three claws that they assigned, the only one that's official is the holotype, obviously. The holotype is the largest claw. It's not the most complete one, though. It's still pretty complete. So you can see a lot of the details, but not the most complete is the largest think they probably did that because that way it's the more adult-like of the individuals. Otherwise, I would have thought they would pick the most complete one, but I don't know. They picked the biggest one. Easier to see. Yeah. And they can't really confirm that they're a growth series by histology either because claws are a pretty terrible bone to use for doing histology and looking for lags and things like that, so they didn't do it. If you think about our nails, you can't tell much. Well, it's more like the finger bone. Oh, that's true. Because the keratin would be the nails. <laughs> yeah. So this doesn't include the keratin sheath. So when I said it's like about two inches long, that's just the bone. With the keratin sheath over it, it could be three inches, maybe four inches long. Could be more curved. Yeah, exactly. So it, it would almost certainly be more curved because it's going to continue that same curvature around the edge. So yeah, good point. Given the lack of complete alvarosaur fossils, they didn't really have an easy time putting together a phylogeny 
of where Triarch Uncus fits in the family tree of Alvarez Swords, or really where most of the Alvarez Swords fit in the family tree. It ended up with a really large group with Triarch Uncus and eight of its closest relatives, including Mononychus from Mongolia about 70 million years ago, and seven more late Cretaceous genera, which are all from Asia, mostly Mongolia. So it's a more Mongolian looking Alvarez Horde. And Mononychus is a handy one to have as a nearby relative because that's by far the best known Alvarez Horde. I was kind of surprised that Albertonychus wasn't in the group because it's from Alberta, which is very close to Montana, especially southern Alberta versus northern Montana. But it is in the closest out group, meaning in their phylogeny, it was like not quite in the same group, but really close relative. In terms of what Triarchuncus lived with, it was found in a layer of rock just before the end Cretaceous boundary. And they said at most it's 200,000 years before the extinction event, but it could be even closer, making Triarchuncus one of the last living dinosaurs, along with Triceratops and T-Rex and a bunch of other popular Hell Creek dinosaurs, like mm-hmm. Ankylosaurus. I was going to say, yeah, the Hell Creek is known for that. Yep. It also makes Triarchuncus the youngest known Alvarezaurid. Youngest known weird dinosaur. I'm now wishing I just called it Captain Hook the whole time, so I didn't have to keep probably mispronouncing Triarchuncus <laughs> or Triarchuncus or who knows. I, I don't speak Greek combined with Latin into an English <laughs> translation. I have to like buy Denver Fowler a beer next time I see him and convince him to put pronunciation guides into these papers. (laughs) It's killing me. (laughs) In other news, in Japan, there's a fossilized, most likely theropod dinosaur egg that has been named having the Guinness World Record of being the world's smallest fossilized non-avian dinosaur egg. These records are very specific. That is very specific. I guess it makes sense, though, because if you just say the world's smallest dinosaur egg, then it's going to include birds. Mm -hmm. You shouldn't need the word fossilized, though. Well, that one... Because non-avian dinosaur eggs are all fossilized. Right. If you find a non-avian dinosaur egg that isn't fossilized, it should be in the Guinness Book of World Records for a completely different reason. (laughs) I guess they want you to know right away that it's a fossil. Yeah, and that it's the the dinosaur dinosaur type of dinosaur. Right. Not the bird type of dinosaur. If you were to compare it to a bird egg, though, it is about the same size as a quail egg. Oh, okay. Yeah, that's pretty small. Mm Mm-hmm. So this egg's 110 million years old. It comes from Tamba, Hyogo Prefecture. It's 1.7 inches by 0.8 inches, which is 4.5 centimeters by 2 centimeters, and it weighs about 0.35 ounces, or 10 grams. The egg has been named Himeolithus murakamii, and it basically means small and cute in Japanese, and murakamii is in honor of Shigeru Murakami, who first found the titanosauriform Tamba Titanus in 2006. So the guy that found one of the largest animals ever to walk on Earth had one of the smallest eggs ever found named after him? Mm-hmm. <laughs> That's pretty, pretty good. Funny. In Taiwan, the National Museum now has augmented reality dinosaur tours. I couldn't find too many details other than you download an app and you use it in the museum. And based on the photos, it looks like you can see the dinosaurs you know, brought to life when you hold your screen up to the fossils that are on display. And it reminded me a lot, Garrett, of our trip to the Curry Museum in Alberta, Canada, Mm -hmm. having that screen, except instead of the screen being held in place, you have your own screen. Yeah. Move it around. That does seem easier from a museum standpoint, because you don't have to worry about all the devices getting handled and broken and everything. True. (laughs) Just bring your own device. If you break it, it's your problem. (laughs) In Chicago in the U.S., the Field Museum has a new lifelike model of Sue the T-Rex, and this model's nickname Fleshy. <laughs> it's such a weird nickname. I don't know how it got the name. Well, I guess because it's... Covered in flesh. Yeah. It's scientifically accurate, and it shows Sue eating another dinosaur. So Fleshy is on display until August 18th, and then we'll be on tour as part of the exhibit Sue the T-Rex Experience. And if you want to visit, you can buy tickets online. There's some restrictions. The museum's open Thursday through Monday and then closed on Tuesdays and Wednesdays now for deep cleaning. Yeah, I think we mentioned you have to wear a mask and if you're in certain age groups and all that kind of stuff, there's a limited number of people that can go in at a time. Yes. 
Oh, also near Chicago, uh, Brookfield Zoo recently reopened, and they have an exhibit from now until November 1st called Dinos Everywhere, and they have 40 animatronic dinosaurs, including Argentinosaurus, T-Rex, Stegosaurus, and Pentaceratops. You have to buy your tickets online. Masks are required for anyone over the age of two, and visitors cannot enter buildings. You can only hang out outside. And then really quick, going back to the Field Museum, we've seen videos of penguins visiting Sue the T-Rex at the Field Mm -hmm. Museum, but now Sue, or rather somebody in an inflatable T-Rex costume, has gone to Shed Aquarium to say hello to Darwin and Izzy the penguins at their enclosure. And it's a pretty nice video. The aquarium replied to the video, best visit ever. We love these quote unquote family reunions. (laughs) Yeah, but it's missing one very important element of the penguins going to the Field Museum, which is the most enjoyable sound of webbed feet walking on concrete. Well, in their enclosure, maybe you can hear them when they're walking on the rocks. Maybe. But the little scampering webbed feet is so (laughs) enjoyable. (laughs) In a different sort of news, there's a letter from Mary Anning to William Buckland that's dated February 15th, 1829, about her latest discoveries, which included a box of coprolites, that was auctioned online and it sold for 100,800 pounds to an anonymous private collector. Wow. They were only expecting it to sell for between eight to 12,000 pounds. That's an expensive box of poop. No, it's a letter. That's an expensive letter about poop. Yeah, and other discoveries. <laughs> The Jurassic Coast Trust and Lyme Regis Museum actually set up a crowdfunding campaign because they were trying to bid for the letter and they raised 40,000 pounds in hopes to display this letter at the museum. So now they're going to be refunding people, but they're also hoping to have some cash left over for upcoming projects and buying fossils. And they're hoping that the private collector who bought the letter will reach out to them so they can work together in the future. In Lancaster in the UK, which is where Sir Richard Owen grew up, they're celebrating their annual Dinosaur Day this year with a giant T-Rex on the roof of St. Nick's Arcades in the city center in downtown, and a number of dinosaurs are scattered around the city center. So people are encouraged to follow a trail, you can download it online, and then once you find them all, you can enter to win some dinosaur stuffed animals. The drawings open until the end of this month, August. And last, also in the UK, but in Maidstone, Iggy, the metal dinosaur sculpture, is back on display. And you can see it at the junction of the A20 and New Cut Road at Bearstead. And the Iggy sculpture is a tribute to iguanodon fossils being found in Maidstone in 1834. Iggy's also on Maidstone's coat of arms as a green dinosaur. Hmm. That's cool. Mm Mm-hmm. I didn't know that Iggy made it onto any coats of arms. Well, yeah, we actually talked about iguanodon in episode 87 and included that fun fact about the coat of arms oh i guess i wasn't paying attention well it's been a few years and now onto our dinosaur of the day scolosaurus which was a request from dino bow via our discord and patreon as well as dinosaur 4602 so thank you scolosaurus was an ankylosaurid that lived in the late cretaceous in what is now alberta canada In the Dinosaur Park Formation or Oldman Formation, the exact locality is uncertain. It was an herbivore estimated to be about 20 feet or 6 meters long, and it had a lot of osteoderms and a clubbed tail. Like all good ankylosaurids. (laughs) Yes. The osteoderms were mostly conical or subconical and mammillary in shape, which means nipple-shaped. The texture of the osteoderms were rough and pointy. It was discovered in 1914 by fossil collector William Edmund Cutler in fine-grained sandstone and claystone sediments, and then it was named in 1928 by Franz Nopschka. The holotype included a nearly complete skeleton. It's missing the end of the tail, the right forelimb, the right hindlimb, and the skull. But it also included osteoderms and skin impressions. The holotype is in the collections of the Natural History Museum in London now. I think we saw that when we were at the museum, didn't we? Kind of in the back corner of the dinosaur hall. It's flattened out, displayed vertically. That sounds familiar. I think so. There's so many dinosaurs there. There are, yeah. But that's one of the good holotypes that's in the mix. So the type species is Scolosaurus cutleri, and the genus name means pointed stake lizard. And the species name is in honor of Cutler, who was injured when the fossils fell on him while he was excavating. Oh, no. (laughs) Yeah. But uh, only injured, that's good. It could have gone worse. It could have. Yeah, dinosaur fossils are heavy. Yes. In 1971, Walter Coombs anonymized Scolosaurus along with Anodontosaurus lami and Dilophosaurus 
acute squamias with Euoplocephalus tutus, but it didn't really explain why. He wrote it was based on, quote, the numerous ankylosaurid skulls known from the Oldman Formation, now Dinosaur Park Formation, and Member E, the Edmonton Formation, now Horseshoe Canyon Formation, end quote. So just, there's too many ankylosaurids here. We're going to lump them all together. Yes. <laughs> Basically, he said there's only one genera of ankylosaur that lived in that time and place, and Euoplocephalus was named first, even though that holotype was fragmentary. So at first, this synonymization was accepted, and Scolosaurus cutleri became Euoplocephalus cutleri. Then in 2013, Paul Pankowski and William Blows redescribed Scolosaurus and found it to be a valid taxon. Pankowski and Blows found that Scolosaurus had different cervical or neck armor, and the structure of the forelimb was different from Euoplocephalus. They also found differences in the pelvis and armor between Scolosaurus and Diloplosaurus. Because the holotype of Scolosaurus was so complete, many reconstructions for Euoplocephalus were based on the Scolosaurus specimen, especially the armor patterns, which are based on the osteoderms that were found in situ on the Scolosaurus holotype. So Victoria Arbor and Phil Curry found that Scolosaurus was unique because of a number of features. So first, the squamosal horns on the back of the head were proportionately larger, backswept, and had distinct peaks. Second, the skull armor had a unique pattern. And then third was about the osteoderms. So on the tail, there were conical osteoderms. There were also large circular osteoderms with low central prominences. That means they didn't stick out much. And then on the neck, on the half rings of the neck, there were compressed half moon shaped lateral on the side osteoderms. And then fourth, also on the tail, the knob at the end of the tail looked circular when you're viewing it from above. The club. Mm Mm-hmm. So based on the humerus and other bones, Scolosaurus was as large or larger than Euoplocephalus and other ankylosaurs from the same region and time. But not ankylosaurs, because it wasn't around at the same time. Yes. The claws on the feet of Scolosaurus were hoof-shaped compared to Dioplosaurus, which was triangular. There's also a lot of referred Scolosaurus specimens, which include the skull, vertebrae, ribs, femora, tibiae, fibulae, and more. Arbor and Curry assigned another specimen, USNM7943, to Scolosaurus, and it was a partial cervical ring, neck ring, found in 1874 in the Frenchman Formation in Alberta. That's now housed at the Smithsonian in Washington, D.C. The Smithsonian also has specimen USNM11892, which was found in 1928 in the Two Medicine Formation, and that's a partial skull. And a lot of Scolosaurus specimens were found in the Two Medicine Formation in Montana. There was another specimen, MOR433, that was formerly known as Ookotokia, and that was reassigned to Scolosaurus in 2013 by Arbor and Curry. Pankowski had named Ookotokia earlier in 2013, and not everyone agrees with this reassigning. And the reason is not everyone agrees that the specimens coming from the Oldman and Dinosaur Park formations are the same as the ones coming from Two Medicine Formation. However, the Oldman Formation, when Scolosaurus lived, was pretty dry compared to the Dinosaur Park Formation because the Western Interior Seaway had regressed so far. And the Upper Two Medicine Formation also had a dry environment compared to Judith River Formation and Dinosaur Park Formation, which are nearby. So we would need skull material to confirm if they are synonymous or not. Otherwise, they do seem similar. Other dinosaurs that lived around the same time and place as Scolosaurus included the Hadrosaurs, like Gryposaurus and Myasaura, other Ankylosaurs like Edmontonia, Oviraptorosaurs, Ornithopods, Ceratopsians, and Dromaeosaurs like Bambiraptor and Sauronithelestes, and Tyrannosaurids, Displetosaurus and Gorgosaurus. There were also a lot of fish, such as sharks, rays, sturgeons, gars, and amphibians, reptiles, lizards, crocodilians, pterosaurs, birds, and some mammals. And for our fun fact today, I want to explore the comparison of alvarosaurs to modern termite-eating specialists, because I wanted to find a paper that was about this, and all I could find was sort of allusions to it, and then a few hypotheses thrown in here and there, but there wasn't a real good analysis of like, this is what modern termite looking animals look like. And this is what alvarosaurs look like. And therefore they have these similarities or don't have these similarities. So lots of birds have long claws like the harpy eagle, cassowary, and falcons. But there are also a lot of animals that have massive claws 
that aren't used directly for taking down prey, which is usually why you think of like lions. Oh, they need these big claws because they'll grab onto a wildebeest and drag it down kind of thing. Hmm. Not what all claws are for, especially in Xenarthra. And Xenarthra is my favorite group of animals, probably. I don't know. After dinosaurs. Living animals, I should say. It includes all of the weirdos. Hmm. So it's the group of animals that evolved in South America after the Cretaceous extinction when South America was still separated from the rest of the world. So it includes armadillos, anteaters, and sloths. And it also includes some really cool extinct groups like glyptodonts, which are those ankylosaurid-like huge armadillos with big club, like mace-style tails. And also ground sloths, which were these massive things with big claws and look more like a bear than a sloth, a modern sloth at Mm. least. But how do they compare to your love of bats? I don't know. I just, I love how weird they are. They're like the platypus or something. It's just like such a strange evolution and they're such a cool group too. So three-toed sloths are really weird. You know, we've, we've talked about sloths before and how slow they are, Mm -hmm. how they're upside down a lot of the time and everything. They have very large claws, but they're only used for holding onto trees. So their usefulness in comparisons to dinosaurs aren't very good because they just, there aren't a lot of connections there. Giant armadillos, though, I think are a pretty good similarity in a lot of ways to some dinosaurs. So they have the longest claws of any living animal, period. They're 20 centimeters or eight inches long. And even more impressive is that on average, a giant armadillo is roughly 1.3 meters or 4.3 feet long, which makes it about a 15% claw to body length ratio or over 20% if you exclude its tail. That's a long claw. Yeah, really massive claws. Armadillos mostly use their claws for digging and then also for breaking open termite mounds, which is partly why the large claws on alvarosaurs has been proposed as a way to get into termite mounds, because we we have this modern analog. But armadillos don't have small forelimbs. They don't have, like, claws sticking out of their chests. They have, if you look at a skeleton of an armadillo, it looks like they have four limbs like you'd expect on a quadrupedal animal of their size. They're a pretty good match for the hind limbs, and it gives them that sort of like horizontal back posture like most animals have that are quadrupedal at least. However, armadillos do often walk bipedally because they have these massive claws on their hands. It just gets in the way. It's like walking on nails that are awkward and everything. So a lot of times they'll hold their hands up off the ground and kind of scamper in a more upright posture. (laughs) It's pretty adorable. Depending on the species, they have between three and five claws on their front feet or hands, as opposed to the just one massive claw that alvarosaurs have. But in most cases, especially in that giant armadillo, one of their claws is way bigger than the others. So they have one huge claw that does most of the work. So in that way, it's pretty similar to alvarosaurs. Armadillos, though, are much lower to the ground than alvarosaurs, meaning their mouth is basically on the ground when they're walking. They just point their head down. They have a long, narrow face. So if there's a bug there that they want to eat, they've got a long tongue. They could just slurp it up without having to bend over. Whereas alvarosaurs, they're bipedal. And if you think about like what a compsognathus or something is depicted as looking like, where their head is way off the ground, they kind of have this erect swan-like neck posture. It's it doesn't seem the most conducive for eating insects off the ground. It seems weird. (laughs) They basically be on like their knees on the ground with their little claws down in order to get it. But that's not impossible, I suppose. And maybe their neck is long enough that they could bend down and eat off the ground without having to get into too weird of a posture. We don't have a lot of bones, so it's kind of hard to say. Armadillos can reportedly eat an entire colony of termites in one go. Which led me to this paper called Colony Populations and Biomass in Nests of the Amazonian Rainforest, which was published in Studies on Neotropical Fauna and Environment, a journal I had not seen before. And I had to go there to find out how much a termite colony weighs. So in other words, is it impressive to eat an entire colony of termites, as lots of people report that armadillos can do? And I found that a colony of termites weighs between 1.5 to 22.1 grams. Really not a lot of food. (laughs) 
And that's like 22.1 grams, I think, was 30,000 plus termites. So each one weighs about a milligram. Hmm. Very small. Not a lot of nutrition there. You still have to catch the termites. Yeah. So armadillos and anteaters, which are also in this group, have these big sticky tongues. They're covered in hooks. And they have all sorts of strategies for getting as many of these termites into their mouth as fast as possible. So the getting at them, I guess the claws are useful for that too. But even once you do go through all that work, you're only getting less than an ounce of termites. It's just barely seems worth the effort. You can see why there aren't too many animals competing (laughs) for termites in this way. Possibly because you have to eat so many termites, you can imagine a giant armadillo that weighs over 30 kilograms getting in these 20 grams of termites isn't really going to sustain it very long. Armadillos are generally very opportunistic. They'll eat pretty much everything they can fit in their mouth. So they'll eat ants, uh, beetles, and worms in the invertebrate category. They have lots of small grinding teeth and tiny mouths, so it kind of limits what they can eat. But they're well suited to grinding up things like beetles and termites and stuff. So that's handy. Kind of similar to alvarosaurids, which are known to have quote-unquote simple teeth, and that's been used as an argument for maybe why alvarosaurids could have eaten termites or an adaption for eating termites. Interestingly, armadillos also scavenge dead animals, although they might not go there to actually scavenge the animal. They might be going there to scavenge the invertebrates that are eating the dead animals like maggots Hmm. because they have a really good sense of smell and they'll dig maggots up out of the ground. They can be almost a foot underground and they can smell them and then dig them out. So super gross, but (laughs) they scavenge the scavengers in some cases at least. Circle of life. Yeah. They've also been known to eat small reptiles and amphibians if they can catch them. One report I read said that they do this more often in the winter when it's harder to find the termites and when the reptiles and amphibians, which are ectothermic, are a little sluggish. <laughs> Uh-oh. It's another win for endothermy. You're still quick moving in the winter. You can catch these little reptiles. And one of the most important things, though, is that I found some pictures of armadillos eating dinosaur eggs, hmm. specifically chicken eggs. If they get in a chicken coop, they will eat the eggs. But unfortunately, I couldn't find any evidence of how exactly they cracked open the eggs. I was interested in this because alvarosaurids, there was this paper that proposed that they had these little sharp claws and they would kind of chest bump eggs to break them open with their claws. And then, you know, they were egg based overraptor type original analysis uh, predators. But The only thing I could find about people describing how armadillos eat eggs is that they hold them between their front hands and eat them that way. So maybe they're crushing them or breaking them open with their hands and their claws because they have pretty sharp claws too, and then eating them that way. Mm -hmm. Or maybe they're breaking them some other way and then they just hold on to them afterwards. I'm not sure. Use their tongue. Yeah. The yolk. Yeah. Or maybe, I don't know if they can open their mouth wide enough to crack it open or if they pick it up and hit it on the ground or something. But one way or another, they like eggs. Giant armadillos, and I believe the other 20 species, all live underground in holes that they dig. We don't know where alvarosaurids lived, but it's been proposed that maybe they use their claws for diggings, and we know Erictodromius dug holes, so it's possible that they have this in common. And a couple more fun armadillo facts, because I've read so much about armadillos, and they are fascinating animals. The giant armadillo is the largest armadillo species. It weighs about 30 kilograms or 70 pounds. It's really big. Like most armadillos, it's only native to South America. There are some armadillos in North America, like the nine-banded armadillo, but most of them are in South America. The smallest is the pink fairy armadillo. It weighs only 120 grams or 4.2 ounces, and is just four inches or 10 centimeters long. Probably why it's called the fairy armadillo. It is adorable looking. It's just a little fuzzy. It's got white fuzz all around its sides and its bottom, and then it's pink on the top. (laughs) And they live in little tiny burrows. But like most armadillos, they're nocturnal. So they're like nobody sees them. And they're only native to, I think, a small area of Argentina. So they're pretty rare. Just like fairies. You never see them. Exactly. It's amazing. The three-banded armadillo is the only one that can form a true ball. So it can ball up fully even though that's what armadillos are famous for doing. There's only one that can actually do it. The one in North America can't. And the coolest thing about that one is it can close really fast, like almost aggressively fast, like snapping jaws shut. And its carapace, that armor on its back, is pretty sharp around the edge. So 
supposedly it can use its carapace as a weapon when it's being attacked. If mm. something like sticks its hand underneath it, it'll slam shut around that thing's arm. I think and, I've like, seen injure it. I think I've seen cartoons of that. It's crazy. It's so cool. Most armadillos, what they'll do is they'll either try to dig because they can dig really fast with those claws to get away from predators or they'll curl up as much as they can or they'll use their claws which are really sharp to scratch at stuff that's trying to get at them sometimes they'll do a combination like dig a little bit and then like latch onto the ground so it's just the carapace exposed pretty cool animals by the way armadillos are mammals and they're one of the only other mammals maybe the only other mammal other than humans that can catch leprosy, and they can also spread it to humans. So don't touch armadillos. You shouldn't touch wild animals in general, but this is another reason not to touch armadillos. And also eating them can give you leprosy if it's not prepared the right way. So I would recommend against eating armadillos. So yeah. Real quick, I'm going to talk a little bit about giant anteaters and anteaters in general. They have large claws as well, not as large as armadillos. They're about 10 centimeters or four inches long. They have all the same uses as armadillos, breaking open tree logs and stumps and nests and things like that to get at insects. They seem a little bit more specialized, though. I don't think they're quite as opportunistic. And they often eat hundreds of nests a day (laughs) to get enough calories because, again, one nest of termites or ants only weighs a couple tens of grams. It made me think, though, that maybe that bipedal stance of alvarosaurids helped them cover enough ground efficiently so that they could get to a whole bunch of nests if they were specialized for this, because both of these animals are sort of bipedalish. Anteaters also have a stomach that functions like a gizzard, which is crazy. So <laughs> they eat sand instead of stones, like the gizzards and dinosaurs and birds, but they also have hard folds in their stomach that they can contract and that grinds up the food as well. So they've evolved basically a gizzard stomach. Hmm. Yeah, this is why Xenarthra is so cool, because they have all sorts of these weird adaptations that no other mammals have. But the coolest thing of all with anteaters is they have this long, bushy, prehensile tail that they can use for climbing trees, and they also use it as a blanket when they sleep. Wow. It's so adorable. It is one of the cutest things I've ever seen. They hold their little nose up off the ground with their hand, and then they curl their tail over themselves as a blanket, and then they sleep like that. Sounds very cartoony. It's so wonderful. I'm going to post a picture of that on our Discord, so check that out if you're a patron. And on that adorable note, that wraps up this episode of Vino Dino. Thanks for listening. Don't forget to subscribe in your favorite podcast app so you don't miss out on any new episodes. And check out our page at patreon.com slash Thanks again, and until next time. Good day.